from the shores of beautiful Lake Coeur d'Alene in the heart of North Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discuss their topics on our forum. The North Idaho College Public Forum. With your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. It is a pleasure to welcome you back to program two of a rather long series that we're going to be doing called Journey Through Time, What Happened in the Western World in the Second Millennium. On today's program, we want to discuss the world of economics, the rise of economic power in the Western world. Our guest today is a member of the faculty at North Idaho College, Mr. Dale Marcy. He teaches chemistry and environmental science at our institution. He holds both a BS and MS degrees from the University of Idaho. Over the past four years, he has portrayed a number of historical characters in our week at North Idaho College called the Popcorn Forum. He is here today to portray James Watt, who lived from 1736 until 1819. Mr. Watt was a Scottish engineer and inventor, as most of you in the audience would know. He also was a major developer of the steam engine and improved it from previous uh, development. He also developed the twin action piston engine, and Watt's improved engine has really been a key stimulus to the Industrial Revolution uh, that followed uh, his time. In this role, welcome Mr. James Watt to our program and this journey through time. We thank you for, for coming from the past and being with us on this program in 1999. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. And as always, I'm pleased to have our regular panelist, Janelle Burke, who's an attorney in the state of Idaho, and next to her is Steve Schink, who is the Vice President of College Relations and Development at North Idaho College, and Janelle Burke will be invited to commence today's questions with our famous guest, James Watt. Mr. Watt, one, what was your first invention, and what was the significance of that invention then to future of our life in our time? Well, I have to say my first invention was of little consequence. Um, before the, the steam engine, I was an inventor. I always enjoyed working in my shop, and my first invention was a, a parallel drawing instrument. It had a, an eyepiece that was connected to an arm, and this arm was on a, a movable assembly and had a, a pencil in it that sat on an easel. So I could take the eyepiece, and as I sighted over a distant object, it would draw the object on the easel. And in this way, it assisted architects and uh, people that were constructing buildings in portraying what a building looked like so they could show it to someone else. But I don't think that has much bearing on what we, what you folks might do nowadays. Um, other later inventions that came to me as I was working in, a, in an instrument repair shop at Glasgow College uh, impacts more of modern living. And that was when I had a, an idea of how to build a better steam engine. Uh, Mr. Watt, I, I want to talk to you a little bit more about the steam engine, but uh, first, could you give us just a bit, I mean, in our time, uh, so far removed from yours, it's hard to picture what the world was like, what, what kind of an economy and society you were inventing things for. Could you tell us just a little bit about that? Certainly. The economy was going through a major transformation. Uh, a banking system had only been in place probably 100 to 150 years. The concept of a stable currency was still a fleeting concept. There were money uh, instabilities, but yet you know, money was being developed. The countryside was being transformed from a region of subsistence agriculture where each family grew what they needed plus a little to sell. It was moving from that to a society where more people were going into the, the cities and taking up crafts. As transportation between Great Britain and Europe increased, the flow of, of material and people between the, the continent and Great Britain uh, stimulated the desires of people for a more comfortable existence. The, the houses of the time were heated with low-grade coal, and so uh, Indoor plumbing was unheard of. 
Uh, traveling was, was a very slow process. Uh, as I worked uh, after the, the engine was developed and we were installing steam engines around the countryside, uh, a typical day would be traveling maybe 10 or 12 miles and it would be by carriage over bumpy roads and bad weather with no prearranged housing, no, no accommodations waiting for us. We might get to a, our destination for the night and find out the one inn had no room. And so we'd get back in the carriage and, and try to go to the next small town and hope to find accommodations. So the, it was a very, um, to me, a reasonable desire for people like myself to want a better quality of life. We, we wanted to have some of the comfort that we could see in some of the wealthier people, but it was only the very wealthy that, that had the, the benefits of a, of a better life but yet uh, it looked like it was something that was doable at the time through what uh, has become known as the Industrial Revolution, the change from agriculture into an industrialized society. Yeah, and, and I wonder if you could, um, I'm getting sidetracked again, but I think it's important that we do. I, I note that, that uh, you were born in 1736 and lived to the ripe old age of 86. I always thought the Industrial Re Revolution was, was largely a creature of the 19th century, of the, of the 1800s. But you were inventing things or improving on things that were key to that Industrial Revolution in the mid to late 1700s, is that correct? That's certainly correct. The, any process such as this time called the Industrial Revolution takes many people in a long period of time. Um, time was different then than I think it is in your time today. Change was very slow, and so even though we considered it rapid some of the changes that were brought on in our society uh, that my patent extension was 25 years was not unreasonable. Uh, we, it took a long time to develop uh, new ideas and to communicate them. It's emerging technology. I know that you've already made this comment earlier and on your visit in time to 1999 on our campus. Many people who read about James Watt uh, briefly, not in detail, uh, give you total and complete credit for the invention of the steam engine. And I know you're here to indicate that that's not the case. So would you address that issue, plus talk about where the steam engine was uh, at the time that you became involved in what you did to make a tremendous difference? And uh, let me give you some credit here, because uh, without your creativity, the steam engine would not have been as effective until someone sometime in the future uh, would have developed what you did. When I was, was born in 1736, the steam engine had already been in the marketplace since 1712. The first engines were very large uh, engines that were built to pump water. As the expansion of demand of society for coal, for energy, and for minerals such as iron and tin, as the demands of society increased the pressure on the miners to produce the materials, the holes became too deep and water became a problem. So it was probably in the, the mid-1500s that men first tried to capture the energy from fire and use it. Um, at the time that uh, we'll say the mid-1500s, there, there was only just four sources of power. One was human labor, one was domesticated animals, one would be wind and one water. And you know, those were just not available at mine locations. So you know, the best you could do is put uh, a draft animal on a, a turnstile to pump water, and that was very inefficient. So the advances that ha were occurring in natural philosophy and the understanding about the natural world allowed some men in the, the mid-1500s to assemble uh, small pieces of equipment primarily made of brass where they could, could heat the water in brass and cause steam and make a piston to move. And when they figured out they could get this piston to move and that the atmosphere had weight, they worked very hard for about 50 years to try to figure out a way to balance the 
energy from fire with the weight of the atmosphere to do work. And the, the first application of that was by a man named Thomas Savory, who uh, obtained a patent from uh, Parliament in the, the uh, late 1600s uh, that acknowledged uh, his right to claim any device that used the uh, energy that was originated in fire. And so he, he built a, the first steam engine that, and it pumped water, uh, but it pumped water for a city. They, they raised water out of a river and delivered it to a, a city, but it was very inefficient and it couldn't do the jobs in the mines. So uh, a fellow named Thomas Newcomen was the, the first man that put what was already available. He took some, some equipment from here and some equipment from over there and assembled them into a, an engine that would, using the weight of the atmosphere, as you boil water and put it into a, a cylinder and cause a cylinder to expand, and then re remove the steam. And the way you do that is by squirting in some cold water, making the steam condense, and then the, the piston drops in the cylinder. So if you hook the top of the piston to a beam through an angle and hook the end of the beam over to a pump rod, you've got a pump. So by 1712, uh, Savory and Newcomen combined to build the first working steam engine that pumped water. And they were very successful. Their engines spread throughout uh, England, um, Scotland, into Europe, because the, the Europeans had not developed a, the steam engine technology. Unfortunately, we don't have a whole lot of time, and I want to take you through one more step before I go back to the panel. And you certainly were very creative, and that's what's fascinating about you people in history that are so well known, the contributions that your creativity is just so powerful. But you saw that what was happening in the use of coal and, and, and the water to develop the steam was very inefficient. Just take a, in a brief way, explain how you changed that to make it so much more effective and much more powerful for the use of uh, the steam engine for energy. Okay. Because of my personality, when I went to work on a project, I didn't just repair uh, an engine. I wanted to understand how an engine operated. And when I looked at the operation of a steam engine, I saw the inefficiency of heating and cooling the expansion cylinder every time. And since I understood the movement of gases, I understood that if I would exhaust the steam from one cylinder into a separate cylinder, I could condense it in that cylinder I could keep one always hot and one always cold, and that would be much more efficient. So that was my idea, and with some assist assistance from some industrial partners, I was able to develop that idea and, and produce engines that were at least twice as efficient as the Newcomen engines. Okay, thank you. Janelle Burke. In our time, people are very interested in personal lives of famous persons, and in your time, I'm sure people were interested, too, in your personal life, but can you share with us uh, some of the important relationships in your personal life and sort of how you think people might have perceived you? Well, see, I was uh, born in a time when part of your vitality, your outgoing personality, might secure you a position in society, and I was a very small, frail, um, reserved child, so I couldn't find a, a good position to get good training. Uh, so I ended up uh, being placed in a, a mathematical instrument repair shop to get some training. Uh, when I finished there, it was a two-year apprenticeship. When I finished there, I went to work at a college repairing instruments. And while there, I, I married uh, my childhood sweetheart, and uh, we had a very comfortable life uh, together. Uh, but we also started having children, and uh, as a result of that, um, my salary was very inadequate. So I took up the position of civil engineer, and I spent uh, much of my time away from my family, uh, traveling across England and Scotland doing surveys for canals, because before the steam engine, uh, you had to move water where you needed power. So I was a surveyor, and it was uh, very unfortunate. I received a, a letter uh, that told me that my wife was ill, and uh, 
by the time I got home, I found out that she had died two days before I received the letter. Uh, the communication was somewhat poor. It was uh, during the, her pregnancy, her, her fifth pregnancy. And uh, out of that, that first marriage, uh, we seemed to have uh, a tough bloodline because I was part of a family who had high infant mortality and only one of my sons by my first marriage survived. And so uh, I was, had children, you know, a child to take care of, and uh, so I continued to work. And, uh, but later you became quite wealthy, isn't that well, correct? Well, that's true. Because of my diligence, I was able to uh, find someone to support my ideas, and as uh, I became more wealthy, then I, I married again, and, and that time I married, uh, we'll have to say, uh, better. I, I married uh, a McGregor girl who uh, was really my support in my, my later life, and uh, we did have two children together. And so, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, my daughter, the only daughter I had, uh, uh, died of consumption when she was uh, 15. So I only had two boys that lived to adulthood, but I was very proud of them. Um, both of them were, were very outgoing businessmen and, and politically uh, inspired. Both of them had traveled Europe because of my, my wealth, and I was able to move into good social circles because and you of my wealth. You belong to a particular group. Would you share uh, with the people in our time this group that you belong to and why it was called that? Uh, certainly. Uh, we formed a, a group in Birmingham known as the, the Lunatic Society. We called ourselves Loonies. And we had that name because we would meet on the evening of the full moon. And that way we could have dialogue in, long into the evening and still find our way home by the light of the moon. And it was a, a very stimulating group. Some of the, the best uh, intellects of my area would meet uh, monthly and have a good time together talking about natural philosophy or pyrotechnics, uh, things of interest to us. We were all um, interested in mathematics and chemistry. Interesting. Mr. White, were you more of a, a, a theorist or, or, or more practical in your approach to your inventions? And by, th by that I mean, did you, did you invent things and sell the, the rights to other people, or were you actually involved in the process of, of constructing your inventions and putting them into, into use? I designed uh, equipment and then we found uh, backing to put them into place and I would go and install the engines myself. The, each, each of the early engines was custom made and so it would be uh, the cylinder might be assembled at our uh, our partner's plant. Uh, Wilkerson was his name. It might it would be bored there, trout, you know, carried to the site they might be very heavy, they might be several tons, and it would take several weeks to get them to a site. And I would show up along with all the other equipment and we would assemble the engine. And sometimes it took a month to two months to get one of the engines to run and be a reliable um, machine to pump water. And in those days you were selling primarily to the mining industry, is that right? Yes, very difficultly selling to the mining industry. They're a tough bunch of people to deal with, <laughs> men that dig holes in the ground. And I did not like negotiating with them. I told Bolton continually that I needed help. Now, Bolton was? He was my partner. Right. He was the industrialist that had the vision of what my inventions could do. I was an inventor. He was the, the man who found the, the need for the inventions and he had great vision. So we moved the steam engine from only a pumping engine into an engine that would do other types of work. We, I invented a reciprocating motion so that instead of just vertical motion, we could transform that motion into a circular motion, put it onto gears and flywheels that I developed. And what did that, what, what new applications did that enable? It, it allowed us to move the, the steam engine into the world of the, the woolen industry into the spinning wheels, because spinning wheels were mass produced, they had interchangeable parts, they needed a power supply. And Bolton knew that Manchester and Birmingham and London were just steam engine mad. So he encouraged me to, within just a couple of months, uh, 
ask for a patent. In other words, develop the, the drawings to request a patent in Parliament for the development of a reciprocating gearbox. And it, the England of your era uh, was heavily involved in the textile industry, was it not? It, it certainly was. The, that was part of the Industrial Revolution that I spoke of earlier, the moving from uh, growing crops to feed people. Instead, you grew crops like cotton to put on the, the spinning wheels, or you grew sheep. Primarily, it was woolens. It was sheep on the, the fields, so you could shear them and put them in the woolen industry. Thank you. You've talked today about patents, uh, and you got uh, the one, for example, for 25 years that gave you a chance to uh, not only protect what you had invented, but to, to make uh, enough engines where you could have some financial security, and your partner was very involved in that. Would you share with the viewers how different your time was than now? Uh, under the Constitution of the United States in our times, uh, you apply to the government of the United States for either a copyright or a patent, and it's an administrative process. That was not true in your time. Share the story of how you went before Parliament, and, and you You've indicated from a very modest way that you probably wouldn't succeed without uh, some assistance. But that story is very interesting. Well, I obtained an original patent in uh, 1769 for the separate condenser. But the industrialist that was supporting me at that time had overextended financially and uh, managed to get himself into a, a bankruptcy uh, court. And so, as part of the bankruptcy agreement, he was in debt to uh, Matthew Bolton. And so, Matthew Bolton, with his vision, saw that it would be in his best interest to accept, uh, as part of his payment, my patent. And so, when he did that, uh, he also looked at what stage the technology was at and said, hmm, I can't make money on this. We have to get an extension. So, he told me, he said, well, uh, you need to develop the request for a patent extension and, and take it to Parliament. Well, I was not very thrilled about that because a patent extension uh, would require bringing my request on paper in front of a very hostile audience. Some of the very influential people in par Parliament at that time were friends of miners, and uh, they thought that I might limit their development of their minds and their economic well-being. So there were several of the members of par Parliament that were quite, quite hostile. So I showed up and made my presentation, and I, I tried to convince them that I wasn't trying to uh, hinder their development. All I was trying to do was, was work as a humble inventor, but realize some return on my inventions, that we needed to have an extension to in invest in my inventions. It wasn't going very well, um, but Matthew Bolton showed up and was able, by talking to people uh, behind the scenes, to use his influence. And we were granted a patent extension in 1775 for 25 years that allowed the, the development of the, the separate condenser. What you had to do by going to Parliament and get them to extend your patent, that'd be like today, that to have a patent, you have to go before the Congress of the United States and. As many inventions we have, Congress would have time for nothing else but to issue patents. So obviously there's a reason for that change. Uh, one of the questions that relates to that, you have also in some circles been criticized, I guess all people are, that uh, are well known and, and, and have contributed in many ways. One of the crit criticisms directed at you was that because you got this uh, 25 years of patent that you slowed down the Industrial Revolution's development because without that patent others might have developed faster. Uh, and I know you'd like to take time in 1999 to respond to that criticism that's followed you in history. Yes, I, I think that's unjust. The Newcomen engine had been developed for 50 to 60 years and had been pretty much unchanged. It was a large, you know, smoke-breathing monster that pumped water. I came along with the idea of a separate condenser which was much more efficient, that allowed the steam engine to expand to many other uses other than just pumping water. But as the steam engine technology advanced, we had to wait for other technologies to advance, such as the boring of the cylinders so that they were true enough that we could, could seal the pistons. We had to have the technology for the development of the valves that was good enough 
so that they would stay sealed. And if we were going to move into the, the next generation of steam engines, which were engines that operated above atmospheric pressure, uh, several atmospheres above atmospheric pressure, you're going to have to have much um, heavier equipment, much truer equipment. Other than that, there were going to be some very serious accidents. And my engineers, and myself included, struggled daily with keeping the atmospheric engines, the one atmosphere engines, operating. So to move to engines that were higher pressure would, it just couldn't be done until other technology advanced. So I don't believe that my patent extension slowed down the, the development of the, the industrial movement through uh, Great Britain. One could even argue, could they not, that without the protection of patents in your time or this time, first of all, you would dampen creativity in the first place. It, I know you have testified to the fact that you spent so many hours and weeks and days on this process. And would you be willing to do that? Would, would curiosity al alone be enough, or does it give you extra sense to realize that you have this protection, and also, in your case, in the end, that you were able to be economically secure? Oh, I, I think there is a certain amount of satisfaction with being an inventor. But my creativity was definitely limited when I was working 12 or 14 hours a day as a surveyor and going back and only being able to work one or two hours in the evening. So uh, I needed some financial rewards, and that's what the, the patent process allowed me, was some freedom to work. On that note, we have to bring the program to a conclusion on behalf of the panel and our staff. Uh, James Watt from 1736 to 1819, thank you for coming to our time and sharing this wonderful story with us. We appreciate it very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to take this opportunity to thank the Idaho Humanities Council, who, which has given a grant for this series, both the TV and and the lectures are going on on campus. I also want to thank the Associated Students of North Idaho College and the North Idaho College Foundation, which Steve Schink is the executive director of. Over the past few years, they have uh, been giving us seed money that's been extremely helpful and made this possible. I'd like to invite you to be with us again next week when we'll continue this journey called Journey Through Time, What Happened in the Western World in the Second Millennium. On our next program, we're going to move to philosophy and religion and art and have a scholar at that time presenting a very famous person in history. We do believe that this kind of series is something you enjoy. Our audience certainly has indicated that at North Idaho College, and we're delighted to bring it to you. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. North Idaho College Public Forum is the longest running public television show of its type in North America and is seen in seven states and two Canadian provinces. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational community outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us again at this same time next week for another new edition of North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station.